Hey friends, it's Ben again. This is a video for the vector calculus class. And uh, this is for, I think it's assignment four. The topic that we're looking at is really getting to planetary motion sorts of things. But in order to get there, well, really in order to understand everything that's um, in the text about planetary motion, we kind of need to talk about little pieces here and there of some other things. First, I want to talk about <clears throat> the notion of taking a curve in space and uh, breaking it down into the tangential and uh, normal components of acceleration. <clears throat> that contributes a little bit to the notion of Kepler's laws. And I want to look at a couple of examples of doing things with Kepler's laws. Unfortunately, those will be a little bit luxury. Okay. So less of a, here's how to solve a problem, but more, here's something that you ought to kind of have some appreciation for, I guess. All right. So starting off, we're going to take a look at uh, this idea of the normal and tangential components of acceleration. And as I say that, I realize I should probably try to draw a picture before launching into a problem. So let me get that going here. I've got a problem already written on the screen, but I will uh, take and add a picture on this real quick. So the notion that we're dealing with here is that you've got, wow, we decided not to draw. Okay, now let me back up there. You've got a curve that you are moving along maybe in this direction here. And at some particular point along the curve, uh, we are going to identify what the unit tangent vector. Yeah, hang on a second. Let me back up there and try that with a little bit thicker picture. So unit tangent vector and a unit normal vector are for it. And then we are going to have the acceleration vector that we can figure out. Now, I am kind of roughly approximating here. And as I roughly approximated, it decided to slide it around somewhere else. Okay. So I'm roughly approximating here. Maybe this is what the acceleration vector looks at right, looks like right here. Okay. And in doing so, we are going to think about extending this uh, direction for the unit and uh, tangent vector and unit normal vector in that direction. And then we're going to think about if you just took the decomposition of that vector into these two normal components. That is probably not quite managing. Okay, I don't like that one. So uh, I'm gonna take and get my picture a little bit better there. Yeah, that's not great, but it's a little bit better. So this portion here, <laughs> of the acceleration vector that is in the direction of your velocity vector is denoted a sub t and the portion that is in the direction of your normal vector is a sub n. So these bits here are just uh, a way that we can decompose this vector into pieces. And so what we find out then is that your acceleration vector at any given point can be written by a linear combination of the tangential and normal components. So, yay. And 
uh, then that's also talking about this notion that uh, the acceleration is going to fall into the plane of the tangential and normal components. Okay. All right. And then I'm going to take these here and I'm actually going to cut that and put us an extra page in here where I'll paste that at. And uh, then I'm going to move the order around a little bit. So this, this page should have been first. All right. So then we're going to come back to this problem here. So in order to find those tangential and normal components, <clears throat> we're going to try it the hard way first. And then we'll see a little bit easier way. And there's like a whole handful of formulas that your textbook will list about how to get these a sub t and a sub n. So uh, for us, though, we're going to do this the hard way, which means that we're going to start out getting r prime of t. Remember that the unit tangent vector is in the direction of the velocity vector. So we just need to figure out the velocity vector and divide by its magnitude. So our r prime of t here, I've given us relatively nice uh, sort of function to deal with. And so if we wanted to talk about a velocity vector at a time t equals 1, which is part of what we said here, then we would go ahead and plug in and get 2 comma 3 there, right? And so your unit tangent vector that you would get there, you would take that 2 comma 3 and divide it by its own magnitude, which would be like uh, the square root of 13, I believe. Okay, so <clears throat> then if you want to expand that out, you can write 2 over the root 13 and 3 over the root 13. And remember that we're doing this in two dimensions. So if we were taking a look at the graph of the function that we're dealing with, it would look kind of like this. And here at this particular point, we would have our unit tangent vector pointing off that direction and our unit normal vector, because remember that points into the direction that the curve is um, curving towards. So uh, we can figure out our unit normal vector at that point by this property that we have in two dimensions that the two things that are perpendicular you can get by swapping the entries and changing the sign on one of them. So when I swap the entries, I would have the 3 over root 13 and the 2 over root 13 there. And then I have to put a negative in one of those. And to figure out which one to put the negative in, I look at my picture. That vector is going to the left. That says that I want a negative x component, right? Now those two things are perpendicular to each other and they're unit vectors, so we get the unit tangent and the unit normal vector. Then we're going to find our double prime of t by just taking another derivative and we'll have two comma, oops, I started to write three t, but it'll be six t. And so our acceleration vector that we get plugging in t equals one will just be two six. So our a sub t, it turns out we can get by just taking the dot product of the unit tangent vector with the acceleration. So acceleration dot unit tangent vector. And so that is gonna be equal to two six dotted with 2 over root 13, comma, 3 over root 13. And so, let's see, in the numerator, we would get 4 plus 18, and we'll get a square root 13 on the bottom. So 22 over the square root 13, okay? If we were doing something that was legitimately scientific, we would probably want an approximation, but for our purposes, just getting, getting that expression is good enough. Then 
for the normal vector or for the normal component of acceleration, we're doing essentially the same thing, but with that normal vector that we just got. And when you take that dot product, then in the numerator, you'll have minus six plus 12 over the square root of 13. So we end up with a six over the square root of 13. Now, what does that do for you? Um, it lets you see here that this value 22 over the square root of 13 is like triple, more than triple, uh, yeah, more than triple the value of the six over the square root of 13. And that means much more of your acceleration is going to speeding up the uh, projectile or the parameterization and much less of it is going towards the turning. The turning will always be the normal component. All right. Yay. So that's doing things the hard way. And <clears throat> then what we're going to uh, look about for the easy, the easy way is a quick observation. And that is that since our um, since our acceleration vector can be broken down into pieces like so, then uh, we can actually say and that <clears throat> a vector equals a uh, in in vector plus a t t vector. And if we get magnitudes of these things, now I'll go ahead and write a, a square on there. Because it's a right triangle, when you put those together, the magnitude of your acceleration vector is going to be the sum of the squares of the normal and tangential components of acceleration. So if you had a sub t and a, you could figure out a sub n. Okay. So that's kind of a, a nice little feature to, to have there. The next example we're going to look at uses that in kind of a backwards way. All right. So remember that we did an example one time of figuring out stuff where you could do the uh, normal, uh, the unit normal vector completely the hard way by doing all the derivative and so on and so forth. And it was, it was a horrible mess. So now we're going to uh, have one where we don't really want to figure out the unit normal vector in order to figure out the a sub t and a sub n but we can take advantage of that relationship that we just saw there, okay? So uh, the thing I'm gonna do is seeming to start off the same way. I'll find the r prime of t. Of course, I have chosen something that's pretty nice to take derivatives of. And so then my velocity vector, I'm plugging in t equals zero, as you can see there. And that'll make this one minus one, two. And then the unit tangent vector that we need, we'll just take a one minus one, two and divide it by its own magnitude, which is square root of six. And you can go ahead and distribute those out if you want to. But now we need our double prime of t. And that's gonna be e to the t e to the minus t is zero. And so the acceleration vector we get when we are again plugging in t equals zero is gonna just be one, one, zero. So the a sub t that we need, we'll take the one, one, zero, and we will dot it with the one minus one, two over the square root of six, okay? And did I goof that up? Uh, hang on just a second, folks. 
I'm, I'm looking at my notes there. Yep, I leave that up. Oh, well. So we'll have to figure it out as we go. <clears throat> when we take that dot product and notice that we are going to end up getting zero. So when I want to get my a sub n on this, I'm going to get it by taking a square root of <clears throat> the magnitude of a squared minus this a sub t squared. And that's going to be a square root of the magnitude of this guy up here is the square root of 2. So we'll say square root of 2 squared, which I know is 2, but we'll get in there in a second. Then we do the calculation, and we end up with this uh, square root of 2 business. Okay. Now, <clears throat> all that to say that now when I want to do my um, a vector equals a sub t t vector uh, plus a sub n n vector <clears throat> that I can go ahead and write down what the a vector is, 1, 1, 0. And I can write down the a sub t and the t vector. So uh, 1 over root 6, negative 1 over root 6, 2 over root 6. Now, of course, we're multiplying it by 0, so it doesn't help. But if you happen to do a different example, uh, you might have to piece this, this together. So then here, a square root of 2 times my n vector. And I don't know what n vector is. But I can figure it out by doing the arithmetic here. So my n vector, I'm going to have a 1 over the a sub n <clears throat> times the a vector minus the a sub t, t vector. Or in the case that I've got here, 1 over the square root of 2 times, and it ends up being just the a vector. So we end up with 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 0. So if we were in a situation where we desperately needed to figure out the n vector, we could get it by doing basically just an algebra. OK. All right. So um, from there, what we're going to take a look at is Kepler's laws. If you read the textbooks uh, information about Kepler's laws, then you already know that these are actual celestial mechanics sort of laws where we've used the laws of physics to find out how planets must be moving about the solar system. Sort of a neat thing about that is that, well, it's neat to me. hope it's neat to you. Um, <clears throat> the origins on it had to do with uh, a Oh, I want to say he was a, a Polish astronomer uh, named Tycho Brahe. I may have my names mixed up there. But uh, it was an astronomer who took obsessive observations about the positions of the planets over the course of most of his lifetime. <clears throat> and eventually, um, the, the astronomer uh, Kepler, after who the laws are named after, uh, actually inherited all of these observations and looked at them in a certain way, <clears throat> a way that I cannot conceive of, and made the guesses about these various things that are now referred to as, as Kepler's laws. And empirically, they all look fine, but he had no way to establish that they had to be true. So Isaac Newton, looking at Kepler's laws, apparently uh, went and took his rules of uh, universal gravitation and uh, inertia and so on and so forth and actually mathematically put this on a solid basis. However, I read earlier today, turns out that generally, uh, generally Newton is credited for this but maybe didn't deserve it 
because he probably had some sort of mistake. I couldn't find out what the mistake was. But then one of the Bernoullis in the early 1700s actually got everything on more solid footing. So anyway, if you're saying, who are the Bernoullis? It, there was this, it, they were a family of um, Swiss mathematicians and physicists from the early 1700s, late 1600s, who did an unbelievable amount of stuff. So kind of neat just to, just to read about. All right, so what we're looking at though is some stuff about um, about <clears throat> uh, Kepler's laws and seeing what we can do to you know kind of understand some pieces of them. So that's this is this first one is where things are going to seem pretty luxury. So. And I had to write this down ahead of time. I just could not write it uh, fast enough to see what's going on. The problem we're looking at, though, is to show that planetary motion is planar. You know, when people refer to the plane of the ecliptic, that is the plane that essentially all the planets lie in. Um, there's a little bit of tilt on some of them, and that probably suggests that uh, there might have been some violent action at the beginning of the, the solar system's formation. I will let you talk to actual astronomers about that, though, because that's I just don't know that much. So, so in showing that the planetary motion is lying in a plane, what we're going to show is that the position vector for a planet and <clears throat> its velocity vector, when we take the cross product of that, it, we're going to get something that is constant. Now, you probably are saying you don't see where that shows that we have something lying in a plane. But if the position of something <clears throat> and it's, uh, if, if an object is at a certain position, then the velocity vector is the only way that it changes position. If those two things lie in a plane together, then, uh, um, yeah, sorry. It, if those things get out of a plane, then that means that the cross product from them is going to have to wobble somehow. If that cross product is staying constant, then the motion of the object has to stay in this plane of the ecliptic. Okay, so we are working on this assumption of a position, uh, a position vector for this. And we uh, also have the notion in here that we have, um, let me draw a quick little picture here. We have the sun at the origin. And we're thinking about the motion of a planet going around the sun. Now, the one force that we know that we talk about for this comes from Newton's laws. And so that force, you know, the whole, whole force equals mass times acceleration, uh, but also from gravitation, the force should be the vector, I forgot to put my vector sign there, that is pulling something towards the sun. So the direction of it needs to be uh, the negative of the R vector divided by its own magnitude. And we're gonna shorthand this. This is super confusing to me to have R and vector R being separate things. It's even worse in your textbook because they use boldface R and not boldface R to be separate things, so yeah. Anyway, though, this law of universal gravitation, here is the unit vector. And when you put a negative in front of it, it's pointing back towards the sun. And, and then this uh, capital G is the universal gravitational constant, not 9.8 meters per second squared, but rather, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to look and see what the number is later. So. 
uh, six point six seven times ten to the negative eleventh. I want to say so. The m that's appearing here is the mass of the sun. Now, technically speaking, it should be the mass of the system that's being considered the sun and the planet. <clears throat> But because the sun is so much bigger than any of the planets, adding the mass of the planet to the calculation doesn't actually add enough to, to pay too much attention to. Likewise, super technically, we should have the, this uh, point here, the center that we're working around, be the uh, center of mass of the sun and all of the planets and so forth taken together. Uh, however, because the mass is, of the sun is so much more, that center actually lies somewhere inside of the sun. <laughs> Doesn't change it that much. Anyway, though, so law of gravitation, force equals mass times acceleration. So we can set those two things um, equal to each other. I think they were supposed to be something else here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so uh, what, what we mostly need to spot here though is that by setting those things equal, then the R double prime and the R are going to be multiples of each other, okay? So keep that in mind as we go along here. So we're gonna take the derivative of R cross R prime. You're probably wondering why we would do that since we're trying to show r cross r prime is constant, if its derivative is zero, then it's constant, okay? So we take the derivative of r cross r prime and we have to apply a product rule. So take the derivative of the first and leave the second alone, plus now we leave the first alone and take the derivative of the second there. So we end up with r prime cross r prime and r cross r double prime, but r double prime is this gm over r cubed times r. And so when we look here, we are taking something and crossing it with itself. And here we're taking something and crossing with itself. And hopefully you remember that that turns out to be a zero vector. Um, <clears throat> you can show that to be the case by doing the, the calculation directly and seeing that all those um, uh, transversals or diagonals and uh, transverse diagonals, when you multiply, <clears throat> they end up canceling out, okay? So we end up with the zero vector out of this derivative, and that says that r cross r prime is constant. And that tells us that the r of t never leaves whatever plane that r of zero and r prime of zero originally lay in. So, so if you're looking at a planetary body that's not lying in the same plane as all the others, you know, like Pluto, for example, is at a little bit of a tilt, then that suggests at some point uh, where that system was started, it had some velocity that was going in a different direction. So there might be a question of whether that, uh, whether that body was something that was captured from another system as we passed by, or even whether, uh, whether something struck that body and knocked it off of the plane of the ecliptic. So, so then the other thing to talk about here comes from Kepler's, oh, I don't remember which law it is, uh, but uh, one of Kepler's laws, oh, right, it's actually following out that same sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> we so far know that the orbit of a planet has to stay in the same plane, okay? And, oh, and there's that G and M value that we've got in there. And with that calculation that we, we just did, being part of the derivation, we can come down to saying that 
the motion of one of the planets can be given like this. Now that is an R without a vector sign. So what we've, what we've done on this is to transform everything into polar coordinates. Uh, the C value is something that cropped up in the calculation. It is definitely not the speed of light. Make sure you know that. And the D is a, a value, I believe it turns out to be the magnitude of that cross product that is a constant. And so, and the G and the M here are, are values um, that we actually know the numbers for. So the C value and the D value are both things that can be um, can be measured or observed. And rather than writing all this mess uh, all the time, I want to kind of simplify it a little bit and write our equation like this. R equals one plus E cosine theta. And I want to do a little bit of a transformation stuff to help us see why that has to turn out to be an ellipse for the sort of things that we're doing. Okay, so if you go ahead and take this equation and just cross multiply here, uh, then we can, oh, I, and I am spotting that I think I made a, an algebra error here. We, nope, nope, turns out I didn't. Okay, we can cross multiply and have the R going across there with the R times one and the R times E cosine theta. But R times cosine theta, you know, is converted to X. So we would just have that the R is equal to some P minus E X for whatever E turns out to be. And then uh, um, if you go ahead and square both sides of your equation there, then on the left, you've got the r squared being x squared plus y squared. And on the right, you have to just algebra that out. Then if you collect everything together so that you have your x's and y's on one side, we're gonna have the coefficient of x squared turn out to be one minus e squared. And then we'll have a two epx hanging around here and stuff, but we will take a look at that here in a second. Okay, so the big deal is going to be the one minus e squared coefficient for your x squared. So if we take a look there, if that e should turn out to be zero, then our equation, we have a coefficient of x squared being one. And when you have an equation like that with the x squared and the y squared having the same coefficient, you can go ahead and solve for it and actually get the equation of a circle. Now, it so happens that the circle will have the center not being at the origin, but the sun is at the origin. So anyway, circular orbits, um, all of the planets have orbits that are fairly circular. Um, Venus is actually the closest. It has an eccentricity of 0 0.007, okay? Uh, then if the eccentricity is a number between zero and one, then that one minus E squared is gonna be a positive number. And then you can rewrite your equation to look like the equation of an ellipse. And its center is still gonna be over here somewhere with the sun uh, being a focus of the ellipse. And uh, looking there, Mercury has the most elliptical orbit and it's got an eccentricity like 0.206, okay? Uh, then if your eccentricity turned out to be exactly one, then up here, the x squared would just disappear. And that would mean that you could solve for x. And that would mean that you've actually got the equation of a parabola. And these para parabolic orbits uh, are what we've got if you happen to have the escape velocity for an object and it's, it's getting out of orbit. So 
Now, I have always heard people refer to comets being on hyperbolic orbits. So I was kind of interested in this. But when I looked up the eccentricity for comets, every one of them had eccentricities that were less than one. And that eccentricity being less than one would put them on an elliptical orbit. But that also makes some sense because if you've got a hyperbolic orbit, that comet is never coming back, okay? And um, so there are comets that do that sort of thing, but the, they're not the ones that we have cataloged, of course. So um, I suppose probably that, uh, that extraterrestrial object that came through Oumuamua, maybe we would refer to that as being a hyperbolic orbit, okay? But here's something I will comment, and this is the, the big nerd in me uh, taking over. There is a little bit of an etymological thing going on here with these, these names. Para means equal to. Hyper means more than. So this parabolic and hyperbolic, it's about the eccentricity being equal to one or more than one. So technically speaking, I guess here with our eccentricities being less than one, we'd refer to elliptical things as hypo Symbolic, but um, that is a bad pun and I should probably stop there. So anyway, so uh, taking a look at Kepler's laws, which you got there in the textbook, I've got a couple of exercises where I ask you to do something with them. You can't do much. Um, the, the actual derivation stuff, I can follow it, but it's, it's very messy and it has lots of terms flowing around more than anything because you are living in a science-based society and you are going to um, have a degree that says that that you understand calculus and uh, physics and stuff you ought to have read through those at some point so if you didn't read through them and somebody asks you then you should you should maybe fib about it a little bit because you you ought to understand it but it's a very yucky calculation to actually go through and stuff so it's just it's just messy algebra but it is kind of neat that all of this stuff when we say something's rocket science it's totally doable it's just that the algebra is so messy that we don't generally want to so all right Anyway, I will let you go. Uh, we've got a few exercises to take a look at in class. And uh, yeah, I guess I will see you in class.